All right, so welcome to the meditation <clears throat> today. Let me know if you have troubles hearing me. I trust that this mic is working. And we will begin with our five precepts and the three refuges. Please join me in chanting the three refuges and five precepts. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Namo tasse bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse. Namo tasse bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse. Namo tasse bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse. Buddham saranam gachami Dhammam saranam gachami Sangham saranam gachami Dutiyam pi buddham saranam gachami Dutiyam pi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyam pi sanghang saranang gachami. Tatiyam pi buddhang saranang gachami. Tatiyam pi dhammam saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi sangham saranam gachami. Panati pata veramani sikha padam samadhyami. Adinna dana vera mani sikha padam samadhyami. Kami su micha chara vera mani sikha padam samadhyami. Musavada vera mani Sikha padam samadhyami Suramire majjapamadathana veramani Sikha padam samadhyami Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu <coughs> So it's time for meditation. Begin by sitting comfortably and closing your eyes. Taking a deep breath in and releasing so you feel this body. You may repeat as long as you want, as many times as you want.
relax your body starting from the top of your head and down to the soles of your feet Look at your face from your mental eye. Relax your facial expressions, your forehead, your eyes. Because your eyes are closed, you have given a break. You don't see objects or images outside so that aspect of cognition has already stopped and turned off also notice the back of your head Not much happening in your neck, so you go down to your shoulders. Where sometimes people keep some burdens and anxiety. Relax. Take a deep breath in so you can sense, notice your shoulders. Another one. Your arms are moving rhythmically. There is a rhythm. As you breathe in and breathe out. Your elbows are resting. Your hands and the palms, your fingers, these are also comfortable. Not bothering you. Now move to your chest, your abdomen area. Below the ab abdomen, you see your pelvis, the waistline, and your spine. You have made a straight line supporting this meditation. You relax the muscles pressed against the seat by moving or changing your position if you have to.
Your breathing is continuous. Evens out with the in breath and the out breath. Meaning you feel the same length as you breathe in and breathe out. Continue to relax below your knees. The long shin bones between the knee and the ankle on both feet. Feel the soles of your feet, also the toes. Release any past, future anxiety, depression, any negativity into the space. And now you invite positivity, positive energy back into the center of your body, the heart base. You feel luminous, radiant as you begin cleansing and purifying the body and mind. You don't fall asleep. You stay energetic and you sustain that energy throughout the course of this meditation. Now you give thorough attention to your breathing in and breathing out. As air goes in through your nostrils, take notice. without missing any step, any breath. Mindfully, you breathe in. Mindfully, you breathe out. So you hear the sound of raining in Southfield from where I'm guiding this meditation.
to continue to mindfully breathe in and mindfully breathe out. As you mindfully breathe in and mindfully breathe out, you also notice the tranquility that is arising in your body and mind rather quickly because of your past meditations and other conditions. Sometimes it happens faster in a guided meditation. Now add a little bit advanced technique given by the Buddha to focus a little bit more in your inhaling and exhaling, which is as you breathe in long, you know you are breathing in long. As you breathe out long, you know you are breathing out long. Or as you breathe in short or breathe out short, you know immediately.
Now you not only mindfully breathe in, you also know the length, the shortness of your breath. Short breath or long breath, you know as they happen. without missing any. So you are not going into your thought streams and other things. This one activity is your focus. Breathing in and breathing out. A little bit more than you're naturally breathing in. It's, you are not letting it happen. You are doing it. So this is an easy way to arouse energy. Which is sometimes unarousable without giving a little bit of effort. Mindfully breathe in, mindfully breathe out. Now you are perhaps experiencing the whole body. So becoming a little bit more advanced than the step two. So you are experiencing and sensitive to the body. You breathe in and you breathe out. The first two steps are always there. Mindfully, you breathe in. You know whether it's long or short. And you also know the body's movement.
you will gradually notice the body disappearing so you let go stay with the mind that which focuses on this activity So your tranquility is getting stronger and this is born of seclusion, meaning you have stopped seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, physical sensations and thinking. You are secluded. Now arises Piti and Sukha, joy and happiness. Together, enjoy it. Whatever joy and happiness that you experience, rejoice in it. This is freedom. You can still remain focused on inhaling and exhaling.
speaker this one uh, that is to be blamed uh, which has better sound I'm not sure if, uh, if you heard it well or I will find out by talking to some people later uh, so today we are <clears throat> going to talk about Chitta, Mano and Vinyan let me share the screen with you. So this is that article. So Chitta, Mano and Vinyan. These, uh, these are terms, I think, uh, pre-Buddhist before the Buddha and uh, they are very much common in Buddhist language, in Buddhist psychos, you know, psychological, philosophical discussions. When this uh, writer, Rune E. A. Johansson, he writes this to University of Ceylon Review, Volume 23, this is written in 19, 1965, long time ago. And he says this is a psychosemantic investigation. So when it says psychosemantic, 
uh, semantic has something to do with common sense and meaning making. Psycho has something to do with the philosophy of mind. So he's, he's using a, a method used by researchers in their papers and by this he's asking questions and trying to make meaning based on these questions. And he begins by putting these three words. He says, Chitta is most commonly translated by thought. And he puts it in plural, saying thoughts, mind, heart, mood, emotion, idea, reasoning, attitudes, and also consciousness. Manu is mind, again, thought, and inner sense. Vijnana, now we have used it as consciousness, and then it says discriminatory consciousness, which means dividing as eye consciousness, ear consciousness, so that is discriminative, and rebirth consciousness. So, Uppati, like being born again, and that consciousness. Chutti Chitta, so I think that is the term. Chutti Chitta, rebirth consciousness. Uh, Chutti is actually something to do with dying, the last thought that you have at the moment of death and that will have uh, that will put a huge weight on where you are gone afterwards. If you had thoughts of heavenly rewards perhaps and you are bound to go in heaven and enjoy heavenly pleasures. So make sure you think of heavenly things if you want to go there. But the Buddha has discouraged that. <clears throat> And uh, relinking, conscious relinking is like making links again and again. Consciousness is uh, again like relinking consciousness put together. Cognition, uh, that is another term used for vijnana. Intellect and intellection and intelligence. So these are different uh, translations. So let me give you what I think about this. When I think of chitta, I think of the mind. And in Pali also, chitta is very much the mind, the place where thoughts arise. So thoughts are arising from chitta. From the mind. Uh, but when you say man mano, which is a faculty, we don't say chitta faculty, we say mano faculty. Mano ayatana. Ayatana refers to a base or faculty, indriya. So mano indriya, which becomes manindriya in Buddhism. Vijnana is uh, consciousness, becoming conscious, which uh, arises dependent on things. Everything is dependently arising, but clearly, if you look at I consciousness, it arises because there is this I, and there is an outer object, and you have to become conscious on it. By looking at something, if you are not conscious on it, you will not capture it, you will pass it. So what is awareness then? What is attention then? Awareness, I think, depends. If you are aware of your surrounding, that is one type of awareness. 
works if you are aware of just something only so that is that awareness and your attention is also that which you focus on you focus on something you focus on one thing you focus on another thing so you give attention to like teachers say attention please and then you are silent you give attention to what the teacher says so when somebody says listen then you give attention to that person and uh, because these terms are problematic <clears throat> he goes on they are investigating these in lengthy in this lengthy article and uh, so he has started his explanation starts stating that many of the english terms are very vague it's not just english terms if you say spanish terms or any other language for these things are very vague the reason may be either that the corresponding pali terms are equally vague see that the exact meaning of them is not known some of the english terms for the same pali terms have a very different meaning so pali and english have different meanings mind means an independent psychological agency thought is probably intended to mean conscious process of a predominantly cognitive character heart an emotional evaluative center in human personality if we then for instance find now that is english so but if you find the passage in pali that says ariye tunhi bhave chittam santhapehi ariye tunhi bhave chittam ekodin karohi ariye tunhi bhave chittam samadaha so translated as ariye tunhi bhave in noble ariye means in something noble tunhi bhave noble silence in noble silence tunhi bhava is the nature of being silence silent chittam santhapehi so santhapehi is like establish ariye tunhi bhave chittam ekodin karohi again chitta meaning uh ekodin karohi is like collect your mind in noble silence it's like focus on it and then ariye tunhi bhave chittam samadha so still your mind stilling meaning you find stillness like a still lake very deep but stilled and you put your mind in noble silence but this translation is establish thy mind in the noble silence lift up by the thy heart therein plant thy thought therein i don't ag agree with this translation because the word chitta is repeated here then we may well ask ourselves whether these different meanings of chitta were intended by the pali writer or if the translator is just careless <laughs> i would agree with the second one psychological passages in translations of pali texts have often proved meaningless to me so therefore an investigation has seemed desirable so the method he is using is taking passages illustrating the use of the terms included in the investigation have been collected from the following works viga nikaya madhyama nikaya anguttara nikaya sanyukta nikaya dhammapada sutta nipata etc and now he goes to chitta the mind 
Number one, superordinated concept. And for that, there is the word dhamma given because dhamma nupassana has the meaning that you are investigating what occurs in the mind, which is a vague term used mainly as a collective term for all conscious phenomena. So anything, any conscious phenomena is called dhamma. And that is born in chitta, in the mind. It is used for all psychological terms, even Nibbana. Which means, Dhamma is, Nibbana is a Dhamma. Nibbana is a, is a Dharmata that exists. It doesn't exist, but it is part of Dhamma. So highest Dhamma is Nibbana, according to Bodhisattva. And now, we usually, now we have a question. He's asking, he's beginning his investigation. Is chitta an entity or process? We usually think of a machine as an entity. It has a certain structure and functions as a unit. It is limited in space and has a certain duration over time. If we, on the other hand, were unable to see the machine itself, but could study its functioning and its products, then we would speak in terms of process. We could describe certain movements, the change from raw materials to finished products. We can make the same distinction in psychological matters and choose our words accordingly. When we use a word like mind, we think of something rather permanent. And the momentary perceptions, feelings, impulses and imaginations are said to be produced in it. The mind has a structure, it has, it can produce processes and it can be used as an instrument. So it is a typical entity. On the other hand, the different difference may not be so great on the psychological plane as on the physical. If you study your conscious experiences, perhaps you will at first find only a stream of process. But after a while, you will discover recurrent themes and process sequences, and you will find regular, the regularities and habits of thoughts. The process are then fitted into a structure which is seen to be more or less fixed, more or less like an entity. So although most of the continuity depends on processes or structures that are not conscious and therefore behind the curtain, we may firmly believe in an entity like the mind. In order to decide whether chitta is an entity or not, we must investigate whether it is described as independent or dependent, permanent or momentary, productive or produced, initiating or passive, actor or act. Good questions to ask. And this is actually my focus today. And after that, we will stop. This is, it is possible to find passages where chitta is clearly said to be a product. Ma akusalam chittang chinteyata. Don't think unskilled thoughts. Samude dhammanu passiva chitta sming viharati. Vaya dhammanu passiva chitta sming viharati. This is from long discourses. He keeps on seeing an arising phenomena in chitta, or he keeps on seeing a passing phenomenon in chitta. Yet chitta seems to mean thought. Usually chitta seems much more personified to an independent agency. It has a will of its own. Bhikkhu Chittang vase vatteti, no chittasa vasena vattati. 
a monk makes his chitta turn according to his wish. He does not turn by the chitta's wish. So you don't follow what the chitta says. You, you change its direction. You make it the way you want it to be. Further, chittena niyati loko. The world is led by chitta, the mind. According to Diganikaya, Vipassisa Chittang Nami no Dhamma Desanaya. The Chitta of Vipassi was inclined not to preach the doctrine. <clears throat> this is a, the Buddha Vipassi. Chitta is an authority that can be pleased or displeased. Ayangmi Puggalo Chittang Nara Deti. That person does not appeal to my chitta. And my chittang pasanna. Your chitta was pleased with me. My chittang pasanna. Your chitta was pleased with me. I'm not sure what that really means. Uh, but my meaning in me, chittang pasanna, mind was pleased. That's what I see in the Pali. So, uh, in all these examples, it's trying to investigate different examples of how this thing called chitta is actually working. What is what is what is it so in my understanding from those readings you know the word papancha proliferations i'm using it not to sound wise because when you use difficult words you actually sound unwise but papancha is a, 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 an important term used in uh, Madhupindika Sutta, like the honeyball discourse, where proliferation is the term used by Bhikkhu Bodhi. So, Papancha Sankha Samudaya sat, Samudayo Satta Hodi. The being is a process of Papancha. So, a being is born from Papancha. So what we are is a bunch of proliferations and proliferations after proliferations. So thoughts and many thoughts born of thoughts, a lots and lots of thoughts and uh, feelings and formations and a lot of things that make the being. So we become conscious on that process and that is our mind base, mano base, mano ayatana. And chitta, that way, can take many shapes. It can remain purified. It can also remain impure. Dusita chitta means corrupted mind. Adusita chitta means purified mind, which is like pabasara chitta mind that is luminous so if you if, whenever you are looking at these terms you are looking at it from where you are and what you have experienced and how far you can go is a good question to ask because we are told that we can develop this mind obviously from before you began meditation your mind was in a different place and after the meditation, your mind is in a completely another different place. So think about that and continue reading. And we will find more interesting things. I like this article because he's quoting from the direct discourses. I wish this was a little bit uh, recent. So maybe the words he may choose will be different. But I have you and... Uh, we are together in this, in understanding these things.
So, any questions? You can unmute yourself and ask the questions. Dante? Yes, Victor. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, um, uh, at the beginning of the Dhammapada, where it says, mind is a forerunner of all phenomena, those famous first lines, uh, uh, w which of these words is used for mind? Manu. Manu, okay. It says, Manu Pubbankama Dhamma. All phenomena is, uh, how do I translate it? Dhamma, all phenomena, Manu Pubbankama, are uh, arisen from the mind. So my, in other words, mind is the forerunner. So Manu is a word used by them, not Chitta. So Manu as a base. And when it says, uh, when you go a little bit further, it says negative Manasaje uh, Paduttena with an impure mind, Bahasativa Karotiva, if you speak and act, then Dukkha follows you, suffering follows you. And if you speak or act with Manasaje Pasannena, that is Manasa here in a, another form of Mano, if you speak and act with a pure mind, uh, Sukha Manveti, then happiness follows you. So Mano and Manasa or Manasa in a different case, you know, you have, you have, we have these world cases like mother and from mother and by mother. So here is mind as the stem and then Manasa is uh, with an impure, uh, Manasa Che Pasannena is with a pure mind. Manasa Che Paduttena means uh, with an impure mind. Good question. Thank you, Bhante. You are welcome. Mark, you have a question. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's a question. It's more of, more of a, maybe a comment, but it seems like, um, you know, the Buddha, I've, I've, I've heard the Buddha referred to as a super psychiatrist. Um, mm -hmm. and, and he really, um, it's really interesting because when you look at these terms in both English and in, and in Pali, they're both, um, both those sets of terms are, are, are very vague. Yeah. And, um, in the same, the same is true in, in, in Western psychology because we cannot touch the mind. Mm -hmm. we can't touch the mind. So, that, so it's a lot of um, abstraction that's involved. So, you know, in, in, in Western psychology, we talk about cognition, affect, emotion, uh, uh, what's the other one, um, uh, mentation, uh, uh, memory, uh, abstraction, you know, and, and yeah. so on and so forth. So all we can really do is, is kind of describe these psychological or emotional entities, but in, in doing so, we, we, have to, we have to label them and call them something. But I think they're very uh, ephemeral and hard to kind of put our hands around you know figure figuratively speaking put our hands around so that's just a comment not a question no thank you thank you mark for that it helps uh, that you also think that way and uh, mind as you say that we can't see it we cannot touch it we cannot measure it and that is the comment actually i got from my professor I think he's Paul Melcher. He was teach he's an American professor teaching in Italy at that time when I was taking uh, foundations of cognitive psychology there. And uh, so we had a little discussion and he said um, he didn't include the mind as one of the faculties. He was talking about just the five basic faculties uh, you know, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and physical sensations included, all these things. But when I asked him about the mind, 
he said, you can't measure it, you can't see it, you cannot touch it, so we don't include it. And at that point, I felt like um, something was missing there, but with all those words you used, it seems like people do use it, but it's not sometimes included because it's not visible. And when I said that, in, in that the Buddha has used it, he said, yeah, the Buddha was a smart guy. Like what you said, uh, the Buddha is a, a super psychologist. Yeah, he also yeah. is a super doctor, Besajja guru, you know, a super you know, doctor in terms of curing mental diseases and physical also that way. Right. And uh, at least what we are learning from this discussion is that the terms are vague and uh, in, in any language. So Pali also faced that same difficulty in, in ordinary language. When, when it tried to speak to an audience with these terms, they didn't give definitive, you know, the language is that way limiting, right? So, great, any more? Thoughts, comments, questions. Nice to see 17 people joined today and families. That's, uh, that's more than 17. Bhante, I have a quick question. Hi. Go ahead, Toshid. So, Tunhi Bhava. So, I was looking up Tunhi Bhava uh, on your article. It had Arihe Tunhi Bhava Chittam Tantepi. Mm -hmm. So Tunhi Bhava, according to Pitaka, is silence, I guess. Yeah, Tunhi now Bhava is just silence. So Arihe Tunhi Bhava Chittam Santepi. Now I'm trying to figure out what that actually means because I thought, thought of it in a different way when you were explaining it and now I'm a little confused. Okay, so Arihe is noble. Arya is when you when we talk about Arya Atangika Magga, which is noble eight fold path, or Arya Satcha, meaning noble truth. And uh, so when you talk about the third jhana, there is a place where you don't really have thoughts. And this is called noble silence. So Chittang. Santapeti means you establish your mind in noble silence. You don't, in that silence, you don't just, you know, talking has, it's, you have stopped talking, of course, long before you come to this state. And now you silent, you have silenced your thoughts. So you have established your mind in that noble silence. Your thoughts are not speaking, your thoughts are not active. You have become just a stilled lake like thing. So you are establishing your mind. In other words, you are establishing your mind in noble side, uh, in uh, third jhana. Hamadrani, are tushnim bhave kyanit? Are you? Same thing. Same thing. Tushnim bhave is a singular word that yeah. you are familiar with. And uh, so that is how they used it uh, by singleness. Uh, Bhante, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, um, now, when we say chittan pasana, then the, that means observing your thoughts. In that sense, uh, chitta means exactly translated into the thoughts, isn't it? Like mind is separated, thoughts are coming, comes and goes. So and they translate it as observing the mind, you know, as you know. Observing thoughts, it's also one way to translate it, but also observing the mind is uh, another translation. Uh, or they say investigating phenomena as a translation. So, uh, investigation of phenomena is the Dhamma, right? Dhamma Anupasana. Oh, it? that's right. Yeah. Exactly. I'm sorry about that. So, Chitta Anupasana and Dhamma Anupasana. I was thinking about Dhamma Anupasana when I was thinking, when I was uh, talking. So, Chitta is the, right. So, Chitta is the mind 
And now that's great uh, when you brought that up. But in that, we are observing raga chitta, the thoughts of lust, dvesha chitta, thoughts of aversion or anger, and moha chitta, thoughts of delusion. And that, that kind of investigation is chitta anupassana. So you are investigating different chittas, different thoughts. Different thoughts, yeah. So, uh, and the next level is dhamma anupassana. You are investigating dhammas, yeah. which is investigating yeah. five hindrances, right. six sense bases, fee, uh, not feelings. Feelings is Vedana Anupasana. And you are investigating... Rising and passing away. Rising and passing away. That is also a nature, you know, dhamma, Dhammata. Uh, rising and uh, passing away. There are more, like five, uh, five skandhas, five aggregates. These are also the five aggregates are in that Dhamma Anupasana. So thank you for that question that clarifies uh, a little bit. But chitta there has a lot to do with different experiences, lustful experiences, aversion experiences, and experiences with uh, delusion, like taking things as I, me, and mine. This is because we have delusion that we take things that way. Okay, thank you, Bhante. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I missed your question yesterday. Only after listening to the recording, I realized you are trying to ask a question in that discussion. I'm sorry about that. I, I didn't hear you at all. Yeah. Any more questions? So, and... Uh, Right, Toshita says, so different comments have come. Oh, you, you guys have been chatting. Um, good. If my understanding is correct, mind is part of the six sense faculties. Thus, I'm not quite sure if we can consider mind causes the other five senses. Um, or they are dependent on each other. Other five senses, uh, kind of my mind is res mind exists as a separate uh, faculty according to Buddhism. So that's because we don't see it, people don't use it as the sixth sense. But according to Buddhism, it's quite strongly saying that mind is a separate faculty. So, um uh, if you are saying you are not quite sure if we can consider mind causes the other five senses, I would say the other five senses cause the mind to be like, you know, minding on the eye, minding on um, the ear, minding on the nose. This is like becoming cogn cog your cognition working. In cognitive... Uh, so Mark says, in cognitive behavioral theory, first we have a thought, then we have an emotion in reaction to the thought. Well, that is true in, uh, in our discussions in Buddhism also. We have, uh, so first it says, chakkuncha paticca rupecha upajyati chakku vinyana, dependent on the I and object outside. I consciousness arises. Tinnan Sangati Passo. Dependent on the three arises contact that happens immediately. Passa Pacha Vedana. Because of contact, there is a feeling. If you are saying that's that's perhaps an emotion, feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling. Yang Vedeti Tang Sanjanati. Whatever you feel, you cognize it. Yang Sanjanati, what you cognize, you vitakketi. Tang vitakketi. You think about it. So that is how the, that, that's the process before the thought in Buddhism. 
So we start from the, the physical object and then there's you becoming conscious and then immediately contact arising, there is a thought uh, based on you making that contact. So an individual process has now begun. So let's talk about these things and uh, read Madhupindika Sutta in Majjhima Nikaya for uh, more details. So after thoughts, uh, you continue on papancha. Yang vitakketi tam papancheti. When you have thought about something, you have more thoughts about it. Now you have you have proliferated. You have made it more. Papancha sanya sam papancha sanya papancha sankha samudayo satta hoti. A being is defined as a collection of papancha and an origination, arising of papancha and passing a, a collection of arising of papancha is a being. Uh, a being, an animal or human being or divine being is a result, a product of those proliferations. So I'm happy all these 17 people are still staying in this conversation that it's close to 9 p.m. here. Any more questions before we close? All right, so thank you for joining today. And we started, uh, we had the rains retreat in which invitation yesterday at the monastery. And Bhante Sankicha gave a talk in the morning because of it was the day retreat. And uh, the four monks here in the monastery are taking rains retreat this year, ending in uh, three months. This is like Buddhist Lent. And I have given a talk there and it has been uploaded in YouTube. Please go there and uh, find more details. Happy meditation and have a blessed rest of the week. Thank you, Bhante. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. You are very welcome. <laughs>